read from Romans chapter 13, verses 10 through 12. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Thank you, Houston. Good morning, church. What do you think about light? What would our world be like if we did not have light? You know, many years ago, I learned that if you park on a parking lot, if it's possible, park near light. And when you walk up to your car, try to look underneath your car. And if you parked in the correct place, you will be able to see if anybody's lurking for you underneath a car. Now, you might say, wow, why do we have to do that? You know, uh, what type of a world do we live in? But uh, it's, it's a pretty bad world. And uh, it gets, seems to get worse every day. I uh, just heard about uh, this morning uh, 200 Israelis being killed uh, and, and, and war being declared. And, and, it's, and that's just on a, on a global level. But I've also heard this past week of somebody that uh, was actually in this building uh, almost being uh, uh, kidnapped. Uh, had a child in the, and, and both of them were almost uh, taken. And uh, fortunately, the person had presence of mind to wear off the, the people that were there. And it, was, it, was, it looked like a very innocent thing. It's, it sounded like a religious uh, person approaching. So uh, you never can tell. You know, it's a very, very strange world. So we need the light. So what parts of the light do we have and how does light affect us? And so today, I want us to look at three aspects of light looking at uh, where we picked off last week. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 13, and I love to hear the pages of the Bible turn, so if you have an actual Bible you can turn to, please feel free to do that. Look with me at Romans chapter 13, not from verse 8, but look at verse 7, just to pick up what we're going to start looking at. Render therefore to all their due. In other words, I want you to pay what you owe. Taxes, to whom taxes are, let's say, owed. Customs, to whom customs is owed. Fear, to whom fear is owed. Honor, to whom honor is owed. And, and it was a response of we as Christians to the government. And we looked at an acronym like FIRE, you know, and so we, we saw this is something we really need to uh, be diligent of. And then Paul, as he's writing these th words, he, he gets this thought that says, you know what, we owe no one anything. That's how we ought to live, except to love. And so as we look at the three aspects of love, we want to first of all look at the knowledge aim, which is the law of love. And so if you want to see the three points, they're going to be right in the top right-hand corner, love's law. What do we have to know about love? We have to know that, that, that this is something that we owe, and then we'll see that this, is, this law is fulfilled. And we'll see how it's fulfilled. We'll see that the law is fulfilled in that if you look at all the Old Testament laws, it's all fulfilled in the concept of, of love. And then we'll see that if we, if we have this love like what we should, as we heard in the Scripture re a reading, we'll do no wrong. We we'll, we'll won't hurt anybody. And so when we look at this first concept and we understand what love's law is, it means that this is, there is something that is insatiable, something we're always going to owe. Jesus didn't owe us anything. We owed Jesus. We had a price that we couldn't pay. So Jesus came into this world and He paid that price for something we could never pay. And then as a result of this, we owe Him something. And what He asks of us to owe is, is look at your fellow man. And tell the person sitting next to you, if you know their name, mention their name, but look at the people around you, next to you, on either side, in front, behind, whatever, and tell them, I owe you love. Would you do that? Do that now. T tell the person next to you, I owe you love. Aaron, I owe you love. 
What does that feel like? Is that an accurate statement of what he's asking of? You know, we, 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 uh, we owe our taxes, we pay our taxes now, we don't owe any more taxes. Honor, fear, you know, we, we don't know. So Mike's just making sure we get that there, Mike, right? We, we owe. We're always going to owe love. Isn't that crazy? The type of love that God is talking about, the one that we have to understand, is a debt that we're always going to have to owe. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And so then he carries on with, well, how do we fulfill the law? And he mentions four of the commandments of the Old Testament. The first four commandments were more what we owe to God, and the and commandments 5 through 10 is what we owe our fellow man. And so he's saying these four as a representation of the entire law. And you can take all the law and you can sum it up in one concept, love. This type of love we're talking about now. So for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery. Uh, let me get on, on, on my page here. Yeah. You shall not murder. Uh, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Each of these commandments are summed up in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So picking it up, God's law, if we're going to say this is the whole law, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so then we come up with this love now, not our, our part to God, but now our part to our fellow man. I owe you love, and the whole law is fulfilled now in this one concept, to love my neighbor as myself. Now, if you understand that, the second way this love is fulfilled is you will do no wrong. Love does no wrong. This is perfect love, church. Are we going to meet this standard? You know... Uh, Always, there's something lacking. There's something more that we can be doing. There's, there's, there's maybe a, a parent with a child that's crying that, that somebody can help out. Uh, there's maybe looking at the temperature this morning and making sure everybody's comfortable. Uh, the, the lighting. There's always something that we can say, have we done what we needed to do? Did somebody miss out on the Lord's Supper today? You know, just every now and then we see it's, it's, it's a very high standard, isn't it? Is there anyone that does no, no wrong? I mean, does anybody ever make it 100% like this? And so when it says love does no wrong to your neighbor, therefore this is the third way that law, the law is fulfilling or that love is fulfilled, we understand that there is always space where we have to say to God, God, I've messed up. There was somebody that I owed love to and I didn't love like I should. Lord, I've messed up. There's somebody that I, without meaning it, I did wrong. Or, God forbid, I took vengeance, Lord. I really meant it. Uh, that person looked at me funny, and so I let their tires down. <laughs> Can you even imagine doing that, right? <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, or, uh, uh, Brad's favorite uh, uh, football team loses, and so I go and tease Brad about that. That would not have been nice, you know. So, so we have to continually think about this. This type of love that we're talking about, if you take your Old Testament and you go through your Old Testament, you go through the first five books of the Bible, you go through Joshua and Judges, you'll see a little, bar, a little book right there before Samuel and King starts called Ruth. It's one of the nicest love stories in the Bible. Now some of you have never heard this love story. Some of you have heard it many times. But it's about this lady, Naomi, who has this husband, Elkanah, and they go into this foreign land. And in this foreign land, uh, because where they were living in Bethlehem, it was becoming very bad, a lot of drought, and they heard it was flourishing in this, in this other country. And so they went to this far country, and they did very well, except Naomi's husband died. The two sons, they'd married, and then the two sons die. So now here yeah, this lady is, this widow lady, she has two daughter-in-laws, that she can no longer really provide for because her two sons have died. And she says, I hear it's going well in Bethlehem. I'm going to go back. And so she, she makes this journey back to Bethlehem, and her two daughter-in-law start to follow her. 
She says to them, no, my daughters, don't do that. This is not right for you. I can't help you anymore. You stay here and find yourselves husbands here in this country. But one of them, Ruth, says, no. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Where you die, I'm going to die, and so on. Now, did you understand what she was doing? Ruth was actually saying to Naomi, Naomi, I owe you. That's why it worked out. That's why this ended up being such a beautiful story. And she goes back and, and uh, Ruth starts to bring some sheaves. She's trying to bring in some, some money, you know, so they can survive. She goes and finds a kinsman's redeemer, Boaz, one of their distant relatives. <laughs> and so uh, he takes favor on her. He falls in love with her, you know, and there's a few kinks in the story that they iron out. But eventually, he has this widow lady who had nothing, who leaves, and she has this, this lady called Ruth who loves her because she owes her, you know, owes her. And she ends up marrying this Boaz, this relative, which is a kinsman's redeemer, which means the children that come from that, that marriage is going to be Naomi's children. And they have this little baby called Obed. And Obed has a son eventually called Jesse. And Jesse has a son eventually called, guess what? David. And he becomes King David. And from there, guess whose lineage comes? Jesus Christ comes. From a foreign lady who owed nothing to no one, but she learned the love that was meant to be. And I'm sure that she did wrong now and again. I'm sure she didn't always do, do everything great and perfect. But it was there, and that love kept pulling them back. You know, I've seen love. I've seen people try to destroy love. I've seen people try to tell, like a young couple, you can't be married or you can't be... And every time, guess what happens? <laughs> you can't destroy it. You can't get... You can't conquer love. It is, it is the most powerful thing. And so as we start to look at love's radiant light, the first thing you must do is know, absolutely in mind, know what this love is. Now, when you know what this love is, is, then you can start to think about this love as being something uh, uh, incredibly important. It sort of wants to, wants to say that there's an urgency attached to this love. We can't wait until we start. And so we see here uh, love's light, and we think about love's light as in a, a, a day. And the day starts over here, and then the, the day goes over there, and then eventually the day is spent. We can think about our faith. We can think there was a day that we started our faith, and we started to believe in Jesus Christ, and we kept walking. And as we come towards the, the end of our journey, we realize it's a lot closer to where Jesus is going to be, uh, be. And so we have to have a sense of urgency with this light. Your light, what are you doing with it? Sometimes I think about the Lord's people as a group of people who meet in a shed, and they study the, the, the different implements in the shed. They, they, they look at the tractors. They look at the, the thing that will spread the seed. And they talk about different methods of sowing. But they never get out into the field and start sowing the seeds or, or go out and start bringing in the harvest. And, and, and I realize it might be because it's not that you don't know what love is, but maybe you don't understand that it is light and that light has to shine. And it's a beautiful thing. So it says, besides this, you know that the time, you know the time that the hour has come. And what does he say to us when we know that the hour has come? Wake up from your sleep. In other words, feel, it, feel the urgency of waking up. Are you alive? Are, are you letting your light shine? Are you letting, are you, are you letting as many people as possible have, have access to this light based on what you what you already know. And so then we have sensing the nearness of our salvation, still in the same verse. It says, for salvation is nearer. So wake up from your sleep, for salvation is nearer. And then eventually it comes to desiring to shun spiritual slumber. And it talks again about belief. And so you have this belief, and you have to kind of want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in little, uh, here is a lot with the man and the talents. In various ways, you can see this throughout the Bible. 
One of the better uh, parables that portray this is Matthew chapter 25. It's a parable of the ten virgins. You have uh, these ten people come in. They both, they all know the same thing. They know that the bridegroom is going to come. And so we have ourselves as the church being the bride. And we have the bridegroom being Christ. And as a bride, we're waiting for the bridegroom to come and take us home. And so we can maybe understand that, you know, maybe I, I need just this much oil in my lamp to keep me going. But if you understand the light you realize you need to have more. And so we come together on Sunday, and, we, and, we, and we, every day we might read our Bibles. We might have a family Bible study. We'll do as, what, as much as what we can to get, to get this in. Maybe we will listen to the singing, and we will hear one of the songs, and it's a catchy tune, and we'll keep singing it as we leave the auditorium, and we'll keep the song in our hearts. Maybe we'll reflect on the Lord's table, and we'll think about how when we took that bread, how we felt so close to God, how we felt like this is, I'm, I'm becoming a, as part of this body all over again. And as I took that, that grape juice, I, I felt the blood of Christ's Son washing over me. And so we think back, we reflect, and we, and we get, get our reservoir full so we don't have just enough oil to take us to noonday, but we have enough oil to take us all the way. But again, it's based on what love is. Love that does no wrong. Love that says, I owe you. I owe you love. Love that says, this law is fulfilled in this one concept, love. And so I, I know I have to shine the light because the day is far, far spent. Who knows when the Lord's going to come back? Have you ever thought about that? What's the first thing we're going to hear? A voice of an archangel. What's the second thing we're going to hear? A blast of a trumpet. And everyone's going to hear that, right? Have you ever thought about that moment? And that brings us to the last point of what love is. And so here we see that love is something that we put on. So we put on lo love like an armor, and then we put love on like an armor, we will defend ourselves from everything that is bad, and eventually we will put on Jesus. And that's what verses 12, 13, and 14 is going to be all, the night, all about. So the night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then, because of what we've just done to this point, let us cast off the works of darkness and put the, on the armor of light. How do we put on the armor of light? You know, it's my prayer as these words are being preached, that you don't take as much as what I'm saying, but that you take it what God is saying to you. And that there be enough time while I'm speaking that the Holy Spirit can convict you of what you need to be doing. Because I think there's a, I think there's a, a million different applications of just that one verse. And I'm going to give you just one possible application but from every lesson, I hope you'll get one thing that you can say, this is, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. And with this one, my application here is, you know that song, Ear you left this room this morning, did you think to pray? How about before you leave your room every morning, put on God's armor? What did that look like? Every morning, you, you pray, and you pray the armor of God on you. God, and now I'm thinking about Ephesians 6, that actually talks about the armor, verses 13 through about verse 17. I think about the belt of truth. God, help me to have integrity today. Help me to, to, to if somebody asks me the truth, I'll give them the truth. If, if I think somebody's needing the truth, I'll be ready to give the truth. How about the the breastplate of righteousness, that thing that covers the vital organs. Help me, God, to be righteous before you and before man today. How about the shield of faith that you can hold the Word of God, the shield of faith that you can use to ward off the fiery darts of the, de the devil, as Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written. How about you can go down to your feet and say, God, help my feet to be shod with the gospel of peace today. 
that I would, I would be your feet, I'd be your hands, I'd be your arms, I'd be your mouth, and I'm going to, I'm going to take the gospel to wherever you can let me shine this, this gospel today. And God, let me not forget the helmet of salvation so that the devil can't hurt my head, that, that, that this can be safe today. And what about that one that we really wish all the weapons were like that, you know, the sword of the, of the, of the Spirit, uh, that, that we can defend off, we can ward off the evil one. I don't know what it's going to sound like if we would pray that prayer every day, but I think, I think we'll be putting on the armor of light. And if we put on the armor of light, what's going to happen? We'll be walking as people who walk in the day. And here I'm thinking about 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, verses 5, 7, and 8, that we're not children of the night, but that we're children of the day. We don't, we don't drink and, and get drunk like poor children of the night, but rather we are sober like children of the day, walking in the day, doing whatever we can while the sun is still up, while we still can do this. And so those are the things we'll stay away from, not just those, that's just a short list. We'll stay away from anything that's going to cause us to stumble. We'll stay away from anger. We can stay away from deceit, from hypocrisy. Uh, we're going to have faith. We're going to have love. We're going to have hope. We're going to have kindness. We're going to have peace. Um, what, did, what did Michael say in the Lord's Supper? In the last week of Jesus' life, he spoke more about peace and joy, right? I'm going to take those two. I'm going to look that up because I like that. I'm going to, you know, I'm, th that's great. Th those are works of the Spirit. I'm going to have that. I want to be, see, if I've got that, the devil can't really hurt me because he who is born again protects me from the evil one and he cannot touch me, according to John chapter 5, verse 18. So walk as people of the daytime, but look at how it ends. Put on. How do we do that? But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. If I've never put on the Lord Jesus Christ before, how would I put him on? Anybody have any guess? How do we put on Jesus Baptism, that's correct. You plagiarizing, Steve? <laughs> yep, he's plagiarizing. We put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that's Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, Steve. I might be off. But I think that's where it says we put on the Lord Jesus Christ in baptism. But he continues not only to talk, I think, to people who have not put on Jesus. I think he's talking primarily now to, to believers. And he's saying, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and if you'll do that, he says, and make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. And so we, we, we know that we're going to fail in this, but we know we've got to try. And, and it's all about knowing love and, and walking in love's radiant light and, and saying, you know what, I want to see this. I want to understand this. And so when I put all these, these concepts together, what am I going to get? Well, I can think back on laws, uh, love's law, and I can think about a traffic light. A traffic light is red, orange, and green. I start with green. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your might, with all your mind, you know. And then I go to the orange and love your neighbor as yourself. And then I go to the red. <laughs> love does no wrong, correct? That's, that's a law. Street light to me is a law. You've got to follow this. And then, and then I, I go to the next one, which is love's light. And I think about the sun coming up and going over the sky. And I think to myself, Neville, where are you? How close are you to the beginning of your race or to the end of your race? Do you know that Jesus is coming soon? And how is that going to affect you? How is that going to change you? And then the last one, the armor, I think about putting actually, put on, on the armor of God. And I think, you know what? I'm ready for liftoff. These are action items. These are things I have to do. I've got no, no alternative. Many years ago, there's a preacher of yesteryear. He was in London. He was a very well-known evangelist, changed the world, converted thousands and thousands of people. And uh, three uh, scholarly people in England came to talk to him. And he, they wondered how could this uneducated man be so unbelievably effective. So they came to ask him. And they were in an apartment overlooking Hyde Park. And so he asked them to look out the window at what they see. And they said, well, we see trees, we see people walking around. And, and he was standing there looking with them. And when they turned away from the window and they looked at each other and they described what they saw, there were tears running down from this man's eyes. And the obvious question is, what did you see? And he says, 
I saw souls lost. Love's radiant light should change us. If you haven't put the Lord on in baptism yet, that's where it's going to start. It's going to change you. If you have put on the Lord in baptism, then you're going to consider, have I done wrong? Have I hurt anybody? Is there anything I need to do to change in my life? Do I understand the urgency of this light? And do I communicate it? And do I look at the armor of God and make sure that I'm protected every day? If you have any desire to have the prayers of this church, if you're struggling, the elders stand ready to pray with you today. If you need to put the Lord on in baptism, whatever your need is, this is your invitation. Please come forward right now as together we stand and sing.